Okay, this is David Zeller, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Monday, March 14th, 2022. I'm delighted to be back with Professor Jonas Zmuidzinas. Jonas, it's great to be with you again. Thank you for joining me. Likewise, good to be with you, David. Jonas, our first conversation was a great tour of your overall approach to the science and research and administration. Today, I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning and develop your personal narrative. But first, a question we're all dealing with right now for you with your particular research expertise. The war in Ukraine. Are you seeing at this point fallout in the broader astronomy world or at the interface of space exploration and defense research? Have those issues already started to crop up from what you can see? Certainly, it's been a hot topic of discussion uh, uh, amongst the faculty. There have been emails circulating, uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I'd say personally, I don't have any collaborations that intersect with Ukraine, although some of my colleagues do. Uh, and uh, you know, there have been impacts uh, uh, resulting from that uh, collaborations that are you could say basically been put on hold. Um, and I've been reading, <laughs> trying to read as much as I can about what's happening. Uh, there, there have been a number of articles, especially uh, what's happening in space. And also uh, more recently, there was an article about CERN and uh, CERN issuing a statement uh, and different scientists in the U.S. finding themselves perhaps with somewhat different viewpoints about what the right thing to do is. Um, echoing, I think, a lot of the discussion that uh, I saw uh, uh, with the uh, emails circulating amongst the faculty. Basically, the, the issues are, what do you do? Uh, uh, if you uh, stop if you have a collaboration and you and you stop it, uh, you know that's going to impact your collaborators in Russia. Obviously, uh, now you could say they uh, should speak out against uh, Putin and the war. Uh, of course, uh, right now the conditions for doing that are not so good. It's uh, you, you might you might easily get arrested for speaking up. Um, the uh, you know, other argument I've heard is that you'd, you'd like to keep communication channels open. You'd like to maintain your contacts and at least try to learn what's happening from, uh, from a different channel. And that was an argument I think that was pretty prevalent in the Cold War days. Uh, Certainly in the later 70s, early 80s, when I started to pay attention to that kind of thing, that, that was the argument that was being made. Um, and, and I understand that, but at the same time, the situation uh, today is very different. Uh, we have a country that has invaded another and is uh, committing atrocities. Uh, it's maybe not where we were. <laughs> during the Cold War 1980s, uh, maybe the response needs to be different. And, you know, we're seeing in other spheres of life, in the arts, for example, or in sport, uh, we're seeing consequences. Um, you know, the Russian team not being, not being allowed to participate in the World Cup, or uh, there was a conductor in Munich, I believe, and the famous uh, soprano Anna Nevchepko, um, you know, they've been, uh, you know, the conductor lost his post and the soprano is uh, no longer invited to perform. So I think fallout is inevitable. Uh, but I, you know, and, and, I, and I don't know to what extent applying pressure to the Russian scientific community is going to be effective at getting Putin to change his mind. But at the same time, uh, getting the message to different slices of Russian society that things are not okay, I think is important. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I could 
come up with a great idea for how to influence the situation. But at this point, I, you know, I, I'm like the rest of the world, just watching in horror and hoping that uh, there's a way out of this. Jonah, specifically for the astronomy community, how well integrated is Russian astronomy with the kinds of things that you've done over the course of your career? I'd say n not particularly well. In my, in, in my area, in, uh, you could say, submillimeter fire infrared astronomy, uh, the Russians have been pushing this project they call Millimetron, which is uh, what it is supposed to be a fairly large of order 10 meter telescope in space uh, and, you know, equipped with uh, instrumentation that works at these long wavelengths. Um, this has been a project that has been around for a long time. And there's, let's say, some skepticism about, you know, whether it's going anywhere. But at the same time, uh, you know, I have close colleagues, uh, I'll give you one example, Thijs de Grau, who was the principal investigator for the, uh, what's, what's known as HIFI, uh, the heterodyne instrument for far infrared that flew uh, on Herschel that I was uh, uh, closely involved in and, and my group uh, produced some hardware for that instrument. Um, he later became director of ALMA, which is this big uh, array of millimeter, submillimeter telescopes in Chile. As I think I mentioned last time, it's the world's largest ground-based astronomy project to date. Um, and then he started, you know, he, I think he retired from ALMA. And then uh, after a little while, uh, started working with the Russians on Millimetron and spending time there trying to help them, trying to help them uh, pull the project into shape. I don't know to what extent he's continuing to participate. It'd be interesting to talk to him. My guess is that that's been cut off uh, since this invasion. Uh, I, you know, I'll hopefully I'll have a chance to catch up with him at some point and see what's happening. There are other colleagues of mine, I'd say, from the more device physics side. Uh, Tun Klapweik, who was a professor at uh, TU Delft, uh, quite well known experimentalist in superconductivity, uh, and crossed over into superconducting devices into uh, for astronomy. Um, he had a some kind of a visiting position in Moscow and would spend time there. This was uh, maybe in the early 2010s, he came here and he spent the uh, uh, sabbatical at Caltech in 2010, I believe. And it was after that, it was, so it was maybe 2011 or 2012 when he started spending time in Moscow. Uh, so he has close collaborations and, uh, you know, they have a lot of good scientists in that area and superconductivity in Russia. And so those are fruitful for him. But uh, I imagine that, you know, he also may be uh, reassessing what to do. So it, I, it hasn't reached me directly, uh, but I, you know, I'm sure, I, you know, I'm sure I know people quite well who are affected directly. Well, Jonas, perhaps in happier news, let's go back and develop your family narrative first. How many generations back on both sides does your family go in the United States? So my father uh, uh, was born in Lithuania. Uh, Lithuania became independent. Uh, it was part of Tsarist Russia uh, until 1918, and then it became independent. Uh, and he was born in 1930 in Russia. I'm uh, sorry, in Lithuania. <laughs> We've been talking about Russia. Uh, and then, uh, of course, World War II came, and uh, my grandfather was a diplomat for independent Lithuania. And so it was dangerous for him to remain in Lithuania when the Soviets came in. And so they escaped and they ended up in a displaced persons camp. Uh, I, I believe they escaped to Austria and then were able to uh, emigrate from there into the UK where my grandfather had been stationed 
uh, he'd, he'd been stationed in London during the years he was a diplomat. So I imagine he had contacts uh, there, and perhaps that helped him. Was uh, it a government but, in exile kind of situation? No, but but by that point, uh, not not quite yet. By that point, I think uh, you know the Soviets had occupied Lithuania. There was no government in exile. Uh, and so I imagine it may have been just personal contacts that he had made while living in London that allowed him to to leave the displaced persons camp and, and get to the UK. Um, and then from there, uh, my, my father was an only child, so it was uh, my grandparents and my father. Uh, they uh, left the UK and em uh, immigrated to Canada. Uh, and so this would have been uh, sometime in the early 1950s. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, and then my father uh, had to go to work to help support the family. Uh, and he worked at the telephone company. And uh, there he met my mother, who was uh, 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 French Canadian, uh, grew up in Quebec and has family roots that go back a number of generations uh, her last name, uh, her maiden name is uh, Shabot, C-H-A-B-O-T, and that name is uh, pretty widespread in Quebec. Um, so they met at the telephone company where my mother was working as an operator and got married uh, a little while later. Um, and I guess at that point, uh, life became serious for my father and he decided he needed to uh, return uh, to, to, to school and get an education. So they left Canada and they went to uh, Indiana to Fort Wayne and uh, have to look, I, I think it was the uh, Indiana Institute of Technology, if I remember correctly. He uh, got a bachelor's degree in engineering uh, after only two years and uh, went to Caltech for graduate school. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, so they arrived here in Pasadena uh, in 1958, I believe. Uh, my oldest sister was born in Indiana, I believe, and then they moved shortly after that. Uh, and then the rest of us were born. I'm a, one of five children. The rest of us were born uh, in California. I was born in uh, Duarte, which is a town a few miles east of Pasadena where my parents were living when my father was a graduate student. And he finished in, uh, I believe, 1964. What was a, his degree in? He came as a student in electrical engineering. Uh, and then decided that physics was more interesting. And so he switched into, into physics and he uh, did a degree in uh, theoretical physics, basically uh, particle theory. And then uh, during the time that he was a PhD student, he uh, had already started uh, spending time at JPL uh, and immediately moved upon graduation into a position at JPL and spent the rest of his career there. Do you know who his graduate advisor was? I do. Uh, and uh, the, my wife reminded me, so I'll tell the story. Uh, his, uh, his advisor, his thesis advisor was Fred uh, Zachariasen and his wife Nancy uh, passed away maybe a week ago. Oh, uh, my, my wife knew her uh, through the Caltech Women's Club. And so, uh, so my, you know, so that was an interesting time to be at Caltech in theoretical physics, oh, especially yeah. with uh, Feynman and Gelman. And so my father, uh, of course, knew them. And uh, I believe Gelman suggested the topic that ended up being my my father's thesis that I have a fuzzy recollection of, of what happened. Then I, I have this recollection that my father was worth working on one problem and um, 
ended up getting scooped because a publication came out uh, as he was working on it. And so he had to switch to a different problem and in a rush uh, produce a thesis. Uh, and uh, I also have a fuzzy recollection of my father telling me that at some point, Gilman's Jaguar wouldn't run and he had to go under the hood and fix it for him. And <laughs> <laughs> Being a former engineering student, I guess that's expected. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but these are all hazy memories of stories, I was told. Now, getting scooped, I wonder if this was around all of the excitement with quarks at that point. Uh, I doubt it. Uh, I, I, I don't, it, it, well, maybe it's possible, but I don't remember my dad ever talking to me about the problem being quarks that he was working on. Um, Anyway, so, it, you know, he, uh, I'm sure, had a lot of fun being a, being a, at, at Caltech in that area at that time. But, of course, he had a growing family. By the time he graduated, uh, there were four children, and my youngest brother was born a year later. And so uh, it was a hectic time, I think. What was his first job at JPL? He was a theoretical physicist at JPL. And this was the 1960s when the space program was going gangbusters. And from what I can tell, he was doing, the, you know, particle theory at JPL. He was allowed, as far as I could tell, to work on whatever he wanted. They scooped up, you know, all the scientists they could find because uh, they had you know, NASA was throwing money at, 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 at the space program and JPL figured it needed scientists. And I, I suppose it didn't worry too much about what they did in the early years. So uh, that's what I remember. But then, but then I think, uh, you know, as the Apollo program tapered off and the NASA budget started to contract, my father had to start finding ways to become a little more relevant to JPL and to NASA. Uh, but he continued basically to do theoretical physics uh, throughout most of his career, uh, perhaps applied to problems that are, you know, were of more interest to NASA. But he was, you know, pretty much a one man show. He would write proposals, uh, for funding uh, to work on various things. He would find collaborators and, you know, he would fund himself. And uh, this was uh, this was okay for most of his career, but then I think towards the end, it got to be pretty difficult to keep that going at JPL. And he ended up doing some mission work uh, in, in the later years. Um, and I think he wasn't entire, entirely satisfied with doing that work. So he, he ended up retiring uh, in the 1990s. Um, it was maybe 94 or 95, something like that, when he retired. Jonas, are and you the, aware, does JPL currently employ, employ any theoretical physicists? Do they, do they support fundamental research? JPL uh, does does support, and, and I, I, I'm sure you could call it fundamental research. Um, they don't. Um, I, I think you would be hard pressed to find a scientist at JPL that was in my father's mold. Right. Uh, I think it has to be a lot more closely tied to um, missions or projects of interest to, to JPL. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Olivier, uh, Doré is a cosmologist, uh, who, uh, is at JPL and, uh, I believe came as a result of the Planck mission, uh, which was a mission to study the cosmic microwave background. Um, and, um, there were, you know, a number of people involved on the hardware side, including uh, Andrew Lang, 
who was uh, division chair of PMA and uh, up until he uh, committed suicide in 2010. Uh, but then there were also people who had to deal with the data coming in from Planck and, and the uh, uh, interpretation uh, of those data. And Olivier, uh, I believe, came to JPL for that purpose to be involved in the Planck data analysis. So he's a cosmologist, he's a theorist, uh, and he has stayed at JPL, but uh, JPL is involved in other missions such as Euclid, uh, and uh, Jamie Bach uh, is the principal investigator for SphereX. And uh, JPL missions are continuing to do cosmology. And so someone like Olivier is extremely important to have uh, to guide the scientific direction of those projects. And especially to, 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 to guide the analysis of the data. And so there are people like that who have, a, say, a fundamental science background uh, who would consider themselves as, uh, you know, theorists as you know scientists but but they're at the intersection of theory and data so a pure theorist like your father that's really a bygone era yeah i'd say it's, it would be tough to make a living at jpl right. uh, without <laughs> more contact with the business now growing up did your father involve you at all in his work did you have a basic idea of what it meant to be a theoretical physicist yeah, my, my understanding of what it meant was that my father, uh, after dinner, would go sit at a big desk and scribble all over piles and piles of paper, <laughs> writing out long equations, and I had no idea what he was doing. And, uh, you know, he would just fill up paper page after page after page, and uh, there'd be giant stacks of uh, pages with equations written on them. Uh, and it didn't seem particularly interesting to me. Um, and I never really asked him much about it. And, uh, did he ever take you to JPL? Did Caltech did. loom large in your, in your mind as a kid? He did. Uh, he did take me to JPL. Uh, we, we had open houses. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I remember visiting his office and, you know, walking around JPL. That was a lot of fun. Uh, this was probably in the early 70s sometime. Uh, so JPL was on my, you know, I, I obviously my dad worked there, so I knew about JPL and, uh, you know, he would bring home, you know, these glossy photos or brochures about the JPL missions, you know, and so I could, you know, that seemed kind of cool. I, I liked it. Uh, you know, and growing up in the 60s uh, in in the LA area, you know, the aerospace business is big here. And a lot of my friends, uh, you know, their dads were engineers working at some of these companies and in the home, you know, you would eat your breakfast in the morning and the box of Wheaties would have, you know, some astronaut on the back. <laughs> Everybody was crazy about space back then. It just seemed normal. Uh, so, I, but I, you know, it was just another thing. It wasn't, uh, I'd say something that I paid too much attention to. I had this idea that maybe I'd be a scientist, but it was more because, more because that seemed like the thing to be it in those days, as yeah. opposed to something that I was particularly interested in. Uh -huh. And uh, I think I told you, I, I didn't really get interested in science until, uh, uh, ninth grade, uh, and I, I think I told you about this uh, algebra teacher that made us sit according to uh, how we were doing in the class, and and it, you know the element of competition got me interested. And um, it was after that ninth grade class that you know I decided that a I liked math, and b I seemed to be okay at it. I seemed to be doing well, and it was at that point that. I started talking to my dad more about math and science, and I was actually a little upset with him that he hadn't 
you know, hadn't turned me on to it earlier, <laughs> but it was okay. Did your parents communicate to each other in, in, in English? Well, my mother uh, learned to speak Lithuanian. Uh, and so at home, uh, especially when my father was around, uh, we would speak Lithuanian. He would insist that we would speak Lithuanian at home. Of course, when he wasn't around, it was just the kids playing. We would revert to English because it was easier for us. Uh, but Lithuanian was uh, pretty common at home. And you picked it up. You can speak Lithuanian. Yes, we got. We were living at the time uh, uh, not far from John Marshall High School uh, in Los Angeles, actually the high school where Barry Barish went. Uh, of course, this was... Uh, years after Barry went there, so I wouldn't have seen him on the streets. Um, and it was near a Catholic parish, uh, St. Casimir's, which the, uh, was a Lithuanian Catholic parish, uh, started by the uh, mostly the post-World War II immigrants from Lithuania. Uh, although there, you know, there had been several waves of immigration into the U.S., uh, it was really the post-World War II I immigrants that were most active. Um, and so I was, uh, I was living two blocks uh, from that parish, and they had a, a grade school, an elementary school, and that's where I went to school. And uh, on Saturdays, uh, they had Saturday school, Lithuanian Saturday school, which I also attended, and they would have, you know, Lithuanian language uh, classes, and you know, they'd make us sing and dance and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, also, you know, that, that certainly helped uh, learn Lithuanian. And but my, mo my mother was, since she learned later in life, uh, and Lithuanian is an intricate language, the endings of the words, the, the verbs are conjugated, the nouns are declined, the adjectives also, it's the, the, the endings of the words change depending on your usage. And it's, it's difficult to get all that right. And so my mother would make mistakes. Uh, and I inherited some of those mistakes, but the Lithuanian Saturday school helped correct many, uh -huh. not all. Now, did you stay in parochial school through high school? Well, my family moved in 1971 uh, from this uh, house near Marshall High. So this was the house that my parents moved to after my dad finished his PhD. Uh, but it was getting too small for the family. So uh, by 1971, uh, we moved to Glendale to a house uh, two blocks uh, down the hill from Brand Park in Glendale. And that's where I, um, I, I, we, I think I spent at least one more year going to St. Casimir's School, living in Glendale, and then switched to the Glendale Public Schools starting in eighth grade and, and then uh, into high school. So it was the math and science curriculum in public school that was formative for you. Yes, the I'd say the uh, you know this parochial school was a mixed bag in terms of the uh, the teaching. We had uh, some teachers that were excellent. The fifth my our fifth grade teacher was really excellent. Uh, and there were a few more maybe in the earlier grades that I remember being excellent, but we had some really, I'd say, very poor teachers also. And I'll give you a little example. Uh, in fourth grade, um, we had this teacher who was uh, uh, from Chicago, relocated to uh, Los Angeles. And we were doing science. And uh, we were reading from the book. And of course, this was uh, at the time of the moon landing. So that was a hot topic. And so uh, the topic was uh, gravity on the moon. And, uh, you know, there was a statement in the book that 
you know, your weight on the moon is one sixth that on the earth because the gravity is weaker. And as an example, if you weigh 60 pounds on earth, which might've been a normal weight for a fourth grader, uh, on the moon, you would weigh 10 pounds. Okay. That seemed, that seemed fine. And so the teacher decided to test the class's understanding. So she asked, so how do you figure out what you weigh on the moon? And then some kid raised his hand and said, subtract 50 pounds. And she said, that's right. <laughs> and I said, I raised my hand. I said, but the book says it's one sixth. She said, no, you subtract 50 pounds. And I went home very confused. <laughs> and I went to my dad and I asked him, you know, you know, what's going on here? And he filled up a page with Newton's laws and so on, which I had no understanding of. <laughs> you get hammered from both sides. <laughs> but I dutifully brought this uh, piece of paper <laughs> and I offered it to the teacher. I said, you know, I asked my dad and here's what he said. <laughs> and she just got angry at me. She said, no, you subtract 50 pounds. The astronauts went up and proved it. <laughs> great that was that <laughs> <laughs> uh jonas moving into the 1970s all of the excitement at jpl did that register with you at all what was happening there well i would hear it at home uh, and you know actually it was my mom who was uh, i'd say you know perhaps more uh, you know, she would, she would bring up the topic, uh, whether at dinner or whether, you know, it was just one-on-one -on -one at home. Uh, and, you know, she would tell me a little bit about what was going on with the JPL missions. Um, and so I knew all the names, I, you know, Surveyor, Mariner, and so on. Uh, so this was more in the 60s. Uh, in the 1970s, I'd say, I, started paying less attention during my junior high and even high school years. Um, and, and even after I got interested in math and science, I, I didn't really return to thinking about what JPL was doing, uh, really until I, I started at Caltech. Now, when it was time to start thinking about colleges, was Caltech the be all and end all for you or was it more of a local school? Well, so, so I'd gotten interested in math and science and uh, I started pushing myself after, after ninth grade, I, I took summer school. I decided I wanted to take summer school and uh, I took the next math course that was coming up, which was geometry. And so they packed a year long high school geometry course into the summer. And so that allowed me, starting in 10th grade, to move to the course that the, as a sophomore, to move into the course that the juniors would be taking. It was uh, trigonometry. Uh, and I, I, I kept doing that. I kept taking courses uh, to push myself forward. And by the time I reached my junior year, uh, my sister, um, had started uh, at UCLA. She graduated high school and started college. And so I took her uh, calculus textbook and uh, on my own, I started reading it and, you know, working out the problems and I was having fun doing that. And then I decided that, you know, as a senior, I, I was going to run out of courses to take that I would have finished all the math courses. And in fact, calculus was not usually offered at my high school. People went to the local community college, Glendale College, if they wanted to take calculus in their senior year. And it was only a, you know, one or two students that would do that. It was a very small number. And I realized that I wouldn't even be able to do that because I was going to be done reading this calculus textbook before I became a senior. And so I started to think about what I should be doing. Um, and uh, 
I thought, well, maybe I could just switch to Glendale College and take all my courses there. And I thought, well, maybe I should aim a little higher. Maybe I'll try UCLA. And so that was that was going to be my plan. I was going to try to take courses senior year at UCLA. And then my dad said, well, why don't you apply to Caltech? And uh, I thought he was nuts. Uh, but, you know, I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. And at this at this point, I had been spending time in the uh, high school counseling center, which had kind of a little library full of uh, college catalogs from all over the country. And I was reading all the catalogs. I, I would, you know, I read all the Ivy League catalogs. I read Caltech, obviously, MIT, Harvey Mudd, anything I could find. Uh, you know, I was learning about, you know, what, what might be an interesting place to go. I was really thinking about it. Uh, but I decided to apply only to UCLA and Caltech uh, because I was just a, a junior. And I, I was think of, thinking of it in terms of, well, what am I going to do senior year? And I thought, well, I'll go to UCLA. And after that, I could apply. Or if I'm, you know, if lightning hits and I get into Caltech, no, I'll go to Caltech. And so lightning struck and they let me in. And uh, that's how I got to Caltech. What was the game plan? What did you want to do at Caltech? Well, I by that point, I had decided I wanted to study physics. Although I'd say it was only because I enjoyed math. And at that point, I started to learn some physics uh, on my own, again, by reading a textbook. And I found it interesting. What happened was my father had a colleague uh, whose name is Rimas Vaishnis. He was one of his collaborators. Uh, and uh, he was a professor of chemistry at Yale, uh, also Lithuanian. And uh, my father invited him and his family to spend the summer in Pasadena. They worked together that summer. Uh, they had two kids. Uh, a boy and a girl, and the boy, his name is Gintaras, was uh, maybe uh, two years younger than me. And so we hung out all summer, and uh, we got into all kinds of trouble. Um, we ended up uh, going to a scientific supply store and getting chemicals and mixing our own gunpowder so we could build rockets little rockets and we ended up building a cannon that shot a tennis ball and we uh, rigged it up because, uh, well, so here's what happened. You know, we would hold the match to the thing. It used lighter fluid. Uh, and uh, we showed this to my, my dad's colleague, uh, uh, Vaishnis and uh, he, you know, his attitude was, well, this is okay if it can be done safely. And so he told us, you can't use a match. You can't be standing next to this thing. You got to be hiding behind that big brick barbecue. And you got to figure out how to set this thing off so that you can set it off remotely and you don't have to be next to it. Uh, so that was a challenge. So, but we solved the problem. We found some old... Uh, slot car transformers and you know basically we rigged it up so it could be uh, operated electrically we press a button we got an old piece of toaster wire and it got hot and set off some matches which then made the cannon go uh, and then uh, my, my friend's dad came to inspect what we had done to see whether we'd done it safely. And so he was happy with it. And he said, uh, you know, he watched us set it off and he saw how far the ball went. And he said, well, how fast is it coming out of the cannon? Uh, and so this led us to start reading uh, and trying to understand how to figure that out. How to, and so that's what got me into physics. <laughs> was that little challenge. 
and probably specifically experimental physics. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So by that point, I had, you know, started reading Newtonian mechanics to figure out how to do this calculation. And uh, once I started, I didn't stop. I kept going. So, uh, so, so that's why I was thinking about physics, because I started to learn a little bit about it. But, you know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't really sure. Uh, I was thinking, yeah, that seems interesting, but we'll see. As, you know, as, as I, I, I was open to the idea that I could easily end up doing something else. Now, among the senior faculty at Caltech, were you associated with your father at all? Did they recognize you as your father's son? Uh, I'd say not so much. Uh, I, I, I know that, um, you know, it's, it, it can, the, you know, I, the, the saying, the sins of the father are inherited by the son comes to mind. I, I didn't really run into that. Uh, I seem to be able to go through Caltech, uh, under the radar. It didn't, no, you know, nobody really ever talked to me about my father, which was, which was good. Um, and, uh, you know, had I, you know, hung out with the particle theorists, they would have known my dad, but, you know, as an undergrad, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't doing that. Jonas, who are some of the mentor figures as an undergraduate at Caltech for you? So, uh, I'd say probably the biggest influence on me, um, in those years was, uh, a result of the fact that I had started working in the cosmic ray group that was led by Ed Stone and Robbie Vogt. Mm -hmm. I started, uh, in the summer after my freshman year and I stayed through graduation. Uh, and I ended up doing a, a couple more significant projects while I was there. And I, I worked with various people in the group. There was a graduate student, John Spaulding, who was my first mentor. And then Dick Mewalt, who is still at Caltech, I believe. I don't know, maybe he retired recently. Uh, uh, he was uh, one summer my mentor. But then it was Neil Garrels, uh, who was a graduate student at the time, uh, who really took me under his wing and gave me these more significant projects to work on related to Voyager. Uh, and I, I learned an awful lot from Neil, especially uh, the importance of writing and uh, to a large extent, you know, how, uh, how, how to write, uh, how to write a scientific uh, uh, manuscript. And uh, I, I really benefited from that. Neil is a Caltech distinguished alum. Uh, he's passed away now. I think I mentioned him in our last conversation. Um, so in terms of, you know, a close relationship, Neil, but, uh, you know, I have a strong memory of a number of the faculty. Um, the freshman physics course, physics one, uh, was split into two tracks at the time, track A and track B, and track B was for the uh, people who thought they might be interested in majoring in physics. It was... Um, a little, uh, a little faster pace. That was taught by uh, Dave Politzer as a young assistant professor. Uh, and so I, I have uh, memories of uh, Dave sitting on the counter in the lecture hall, you know, using his fingers to explain something about rotations. Uh, Tom Apostle was our math uh, lecture for, for, for math one, uh, really outstanding lecture. Just everything was so crisp and clean in the discussion section in, in math one, Robert Calderbank, uh, was my, uh, TA was the session leader. He was a graduate student and 
I'm trying to remember where he, uh, what university he, uh, it might be Duke, if I remember. He's married to a famous woman mathematician, Ingrid Dobishi, if I pronounce that correctly. She uh, was the subject of a New York Times article, a long New York Times article a few months ago. Uh, a really interesting person. Uh, let's see, Bob Layton. I had as a freshman in physics 10, uh, which was uh, more physics for the masochistic. <laughs> it was a uh, extra topics for freshmen. And uh, what I remember about Bob was that uh, he taught us, he tried to teach us a lot of stuff that I think largely went over our heads. Uh, and it in retrospect, in thinking about the subjects that he uh, introduced, uh, there were subjects that I think he found extremely useful in his career. Uh, and he was trying to, you know, turn us on to those those topics. But uh, I, I wasn't prepared for the things that he was trying to get across to us. I, you know, I would listen. I would, I would, I would pick up part of it, but. I would probably miss the essence of what he was trying to tell us, which was a shame. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, Jonas, anyway. what were some of the formative lab courses that sure. you took as an undergraduate? Well, let me let me say one more. Uh, let me say let me mention one more person, and that's Barry Barish, uh -huh. who was my advisor. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, I didn't have him in a course, but I would come to see him. Uh, you know, and, you know, he helped, he helped guide me, uh, take the right courses and get me on the path. Uh, in terms of lab courses, we had, you know, in physics, uh, I took a lab course every year, except for senior year. There was, there was freshman lab, sophomore lab, and then the, it was called the senior lab, although I, I took that course in my junior year. Um, and that was, uh, I'd say they were all really formative. Uh, maybe freshman lab was the one that had the largest impact because what I remember from that was, um, and, and the lab experiments were all maybe not all, but largely designed and built by Bob Layton. Uh, they were just marvels of mechanical engineering. Uh, there was this uh, experiment called the Maxwell top, which had this top uh, spinning on an air bearing and processing. And so it was about angular momentum and torque. There was uh, uh, these long uh, air tracks with uh, gliders on them and with the spring attached, it would be a harmonic oscillator or without springs, you could have collisions and conservation of momentum. You know, you could, you could replicate all the topics in freshman mechanics uh, in the lab and make measurements. Uh, but what I remember about freshman lab was that we would have to submit our lab notebooks for grading every week. We would do the experiment. We would take all the measurements, you know, we, do some calculations, we'd do some writing and we'd submit it. And the first week of work, I submitted my lab notebook and I got it back and there was red ink everywhere. Just every page, everywhere I looked, there was red ink. And uh, I realized I had, you know, not done very well. <laughs> and there were so many comments I could make heads or tails of what I was doing wrong. So I went and I talked to the instructor. It was uh, Y.C. Chang, who ended up being a professor at University of Illinois in, in solid state physics. And uh, so I, I asked him, you know, what was I doing wrong? And he said, you have to calculate sigma. You, you have to calculate the uncertainty, sigma. And that's the thing I hadn't been doing. And that's all it took was I realized at that point, oh, I get it. <laughs> and from then on, it was like a uh, lesson learned. 
throughout the rest of my life. Calculate Sigma. <laughs> <laughs> Jonas, do you remember what Barry was working on in those days? Well, he was a high energy physicist uh, involved in experiment. And, you know, to be honest, I don't know what experiments, you know, this would have been the late 70s. I don't, yeah. you know, I, I wasn't paying attention to what experiments Barry was involved in at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I mentioned in the last session about senior year, uh, taking the course in relativity from Feynman, and that was the very beginnings of what turned into LIGO. Yeah. Uh, so this was uh, well before Barry got involved in LIGO, um, uh, oh, more than a decade before. Now, with your interactions with Robbie Vogt, were you privy to conversations that would lead ultimately to LIGO? So I'll, I'll tell you a few things about Robbie. Um, first of all, you know, I would see him uh, because I was, you know, spending time in Down's laboratory where the cosmic ray group was housed and I would see him on the floor, but I would only talk to him occasionally. And I, I remember as a senior having finished a major project on analyzing Voyager calibration data and, and writing a, a, a big thick uh, report on that, going over to the division chair's office with Neil Garrels to explain uh, what had been done. And, you know, I think Neil was trying to explain to Robbie that this calibration had been performed and, you know, asking Robbie to, you know, look into it and see whether there was anything else that we needed to do. Uh, and I remember that being very intimidating. Uh, Robbie was an intimidating person and the division chair's office was an intimidating place to be. <laughs> but, that, but that meeting went well. Uh, it all went okay. And uh, I think towards the end of, you know, my senior year, uh, I started seeing more of Robbie, especially after that interaction. I would be sitting at my desk in Down's lab and Robbie would occasionally pop his head and, and say hello. And what I remember him telling me about, uh, it was probably spring, my senior year, uh, he came and he started talking to me about all the things happening at Caltech. And, uh, you know, he did mention the uh, fact that Caltech was starting a gravitational wave uh, detection effort with the hiring of uh, Stan Whitcomb. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron Drever, uh, and he told me that Caltech was preparing to build a 10 meter telescope on Mauna Kea led by uh, Tom, Late, uh, 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 Tom Phillips and Bob Layton and a number of other things that were happening. Um, but I'd say I, I mostly knew about the gravitational wave program from sitting in Feynman's class, mm -hmm. from just sitting next to these people who were going to be doing it. Uh, and Stan, Stan Whitcomb, who, you know, had been hired as an assistant professor I knew about uh, well before then, because uh, Stan had worked in Robbie Vogt's group as an undergrad and had designed uh, as an undergrad an instrument that flew on Voyager, uh, the electron telescope, which was the instrument that I had been working on the calibration. So I knew about Stan. He was kind of a legend for, as a, you know, for designing his instrument as an undergrad. He was well known <laughs> in that group. And so I knew about Stan and uh, and Stan was coming back to do something totally different. Jonas, to clarify, in Feynman's class, was he talking about gravitational waves as theoretical constructs, or was he articulating a vision to detect them experimentally? No, he was, uh, uh, in fact, uh, let's see, if, I don't know if I can pull this up. I probably will spend the time 
Sir, like, give, give me a sure. See if I can pull it up. Oh, here we go. I'll show you this letter. Uh, this is page one. You're going to have to let me screen share. Let's see. You have to go on share screen and then. You should have yeah. it now. Okay. Oh, wow. So this is the letter that I'm talking about. Um, and you could, you know, so you see he's writing to Vicky Weisskopf. So this is the origins of the Caltech MIT partnership in LICO. No, no. This is earlier. This, this predates that. You can see this was 1961. Uh -huh. I was, uh, what about six months old, five months old at the time. <laughs> and, uh, you can see he's writing to Vicky Weisskopf and he said, some time ago, you asked me about radiation of gravitational waves. This is a very late answer. I'll give you all the results and how I arrive at them. As you know, I'm studying the problem of quantization of Einstein's general relativity. I'm still working out the details of handling the divergent integrals, which arise in problems, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and he's comparing it to electrodynamics in 1946. So Feynman won the Nobel prize yeah. for quantum electrodynamics and solving the problems of these divergent integrals that show up in quantum electrodynamics using renormalization. Uh, and so he's talking about it in those terms and having problems with these divergent integrals and he's going to figure out how to do this. He's still working on it, but he, you know, I think he's feeling kind of confident that he might be able to do it. Well, that's an unsolved problem. Feynman was unable. <laughs> <laughs> to figure out how to deal with them and no one else since. <laughs> right. So, so, uh, so mostly this is about, you know, from a theoretical standpoint, talking about gravitational waves and also how you connect general relativity and gravitational waves with quantum mechanics. And so the letter goes on um, to talk about those issues. Um, and then towards the end of the letter, um, he's talking about, um, the possibility of experimental, uh, uh, proof that gravitational waves exist and, you know, is it possible to, uh, to have a, you know, to have an experiment that, that would show that. And so he's complaining about, you know, ideas for measurements where you have a source of gravitational waves and something that's trying to detect them and they're too close to each other. And he says only beyond the wavelength can a clear proof of waves be found. So what he's trying to say here is that you need to have an object that makes the gravitational waves and something that detects them or measures them. And they have to be separated by at least a wavelength or ideally more than a few wavelengths. Uh, and for that, he says, I have not seen any plans for such experiments except by crackpots. And so we had those, we had those two crackpots. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> of course. So this was, this letter was shared with the class, uh, at the time, uh, that in the course that we had, uh, been discussing gravitational waves. And so Feynman had, you know, given us a lecture on gravitational waves and had derived for us from uh, Einstein's theory, how gravitational waves show up and, uh, was talking to us about, you know, orders of magnitude, how strong these waves were, or 
instead how incredibly weak these waves were in, in various terms um, in various ways he was explaining to us how weak these waves were and he was also talking about um, you know how to understand the waves in physical terms and you know what I remember him talking about you know you know apparently and this was since the days uh, uh, since the, the very earliest days, there were questions about whether or not these gravitational waves, you know, were were were, were real. Was this a, a, a correct prediction of Einstein's theory? And uh, the, the 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 way that you approach the problem is you you take Einstein's equations, and then you make an assumption that the that the waves are not too strong. And you, you take these very complicated equations and you throw out a lot of the terms because the, the terms are small and you keep only the leading terms. You, you linearize the equations basically. And then uh, those give you gravitational wave solutions. Um, and so there was a question, you know, is that, you know, is something going wrong in that procedure uh, or not? And so, Feynman apparently attended some general relativity conference where it was highly mathematical and people were thinking about gravitational waves in extremely mathematical terms and Feynman was thinking about it in very physical terms. He was thinking, well, what would happen if you had some object and a gravitational wave interacted with it? Uh, you know, that object could dissipate energy. It could, it could be internal friction in this object and then the object would heat up. And if that can happen, gravitational waves must be real. Uh, so he was thinking about gravitational waves from that perspective and he was lecturing to us from that perspective. Jonas, between Robbie Vogt and Ed Stone and, and your, your interface with cosmic ray research as an undergraduate, was any of that relevant to what was happening at JPL at that time? That's that's why I was sent uh, uh, for the Jupiter encounter. I mean, it was that connection, uh, and uh, you know, the cosmic ray instrument, uh, you know, the this electron telescope that I was working on the calibration of uh, was part of a cosmic ray subsystem that was flying on both Voyagers. Uh, so there was a pretty tight connection with JPL. Um, and, uh, you know, I, like, you know, everyone else at Caltech at the time, I was following what was happening with Voyager. Uh, I, I would, you know, pay attention to the encounters and, you know, there was a lot of uh, excitement surrounding them. Um, so I'd say, uh, you know, I, you know, J JPL was, uh, you know, never, never felt that far away when I was, uh, when I was an undergraduate. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, undergraduates could come to the gate at JPL and you could show your Caltech ID and right. you could go walk on campus. And you know, it was very easy in those days. Um, and I remember coming to JPL and I, I can't remember what for, but I remember doing that on a number of occasions. And my, uh, my uh, roommates, well, at least one roommate in, in sophomore year, uh, Rick Vasquez, uh, was working at JPL. He had graduated from Caltech uh, and had taken a job at JPL for a few years, and then eventually he went uh, to graduate school. Uh, but while I was living with him, he was, uh, he was working at JPL. Uh, after graduation and so i would hear about what he was doing uh he was working in a group led by frank grunthainer uh, and frank was uh studying was a i think also a caltech phd who was studying the uh chemistry of the surface of silicon uh at jpl uh, among other things he he was i guess you could call him a surface scientist these days um, 
So JPL intersected my life in, in various ways. I remember going to a party uh, at Frank Grunthainer's house uh, where a bunch of his JPL colleagues were invited and, and somehow I ended up tagging along with my roommate. Uh, I remember going to uh, another party, which was a Cosmic Ray group party at some house overlooking the Rose Bowl. I forgot whose house it was. But it was a it was a nice event and a beautiful view looking down and you know everyone from the cosmic ray group was there. Um, did, we were just in the thick of it. Did you meet Charles Alachi as an undergraduate? I did not. He uh, he was at JPL by then, uh, and it was really only when uh you know we started hearing about his uh, uh radar experiment on the shuttle and the things that it was finding that i became aware of his name uh, I, I didn't know him uh before then his advisor charles pappas uh, was somebody that i knew about as as an undergraduate and i believe my dad took a course from him if i'm not mistaken um but I didn't didn't really know about Charles uh, back then. Jonas, when it was time to think about graduate school, did you consider Caltech? Did you give thought to staying in Pasadena? Well, the advice that everybody was given was that you should really go somewhere else. Uh, you shouldn't stay at Caltech. You should, you know, it, it, it's better for you if you go uh, to a different school. And uh, I was also at the same time thinking that uh, I wasn't sure that physics was my future. Hmm. I really had enjoyed it. I especially had enjoyed uh, Feynman's courses a senior year, but I had ended up taking a lot of courses in economics and there was a, uh, there were courses offered in business economics and management, you know, things like you know accounting and finance and there was a visiting lecture from the business school at UCLA and so I had I had some interest in those topics as well and my uh, economics professor you know told me I should really think about doing a degree in economics I wasn't sure that that was the right path either but I was I was thinking about you know, various options. And uh, I was also thinking about perhaps taking a job for a few years and then continuing in graduate school. But I decided that I would apply uh, to graduate school in, in physics and and I did and I just, and it was really Barry Barish who uh, had suggested that I think hard about Berkeley and I apply there. And uh, that's where I ended up going. What was the source of Barry's advice to look at Berkeley? Uh, I think he was a Berkeley product. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was familiar with the Ivy Leagues, but uh, maybe not as familiar with Berkeley as I should have been. And so with Barry's advice, I started looking at Berkeley and I got interested and I found that they were doing lots of interesting things. Of course, Berkeley has a rich history in physics. And so, uh, so that's where I ended up and very happily. So after the fact, did you have an idea of who you would work with even before you got to Berkeley? My, uh, I'd say I, I, it, 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 given, given what I know today about applying to graduate school and the kind of advice I give to students, I think I did everything pretty much exactly wrong. <laughs> I wasn't sure what I wanted to study uh, in physics, and I was honest about that, and that's a mistake. You should, you should say that you're you're interested in some particular area, and you should be definite about it. I, I said I wasn't sure if I wanted to do theory or experiment. That's a mistake. Uh, <laughs> you should definitely choose, and if you have any interest in doing experiment, you should say experiment and not theory. Uh, so yeah, my 
I think if I submitted my application today, it would get, you know, summarily rejected. <laughs> <laughs> but I came to Berkeley without uh, much of an idea of what I wanted to do. And I think I mentioned last time that this was um, in the early 80s, the Reagan recession was coming on and really smart people finishing their PhDs in theoretical physics at Berkeley were finding it difficult to find employment. And uh, all that percolated down to, to us uh, first year students. And I, you know, I, I had a, uh, I, I was a TA in a physics for poets course, with, which is a huge class at Berkeley, a lot of undergraduates trying to fulfill their science requirement. And the head TA was a senior, maybe a fifth year or a sixth year uh, student in theory who was still unable to find a research advisor, despite the fact that he was really, really smart. And I think at that point I decided I better, better do experiment and I better pick up some practical skills <laughs> while, while I was in graduate school. So that's, I think I told you last time, that's how I ended up in astrophysics. Jonas, of course, Berkeley is so much larger than Caltech. What about the physics department specifically? Did that also feel like a much larger department than, than at Caltech? It, it felt larger, but I'd say uh, there was really a community feeling inside the physics department. It really felt like you were part of this community. Uh, you felt that you were really in the physics department at Berkeley as opposed to a student in this much larger university. You'd run into students, you know, obviously from other departments, but life really centered around the physics department. And, uh, you know, in the first few years, you're taking courses, you're serving as a TA, um, and uh, you're trying to find a... a thesis research project. And so you end up talking to a lot of professors, you end up meeting a lot of professors. And, uh, uh, you know, that was, that was I interesting. Our, you know, I, I remember a, a number of them. Owen Chamberlain was one of, he was a Nobel prize winner who was uh, the sweetest man you'd ever meet. And he really took a he would spend a lot of time with first year students, uh, guiding them, helping them, uh, especially the students who needed a little extra help to pass the, the written exams. Uh, he would work with them. Uh, I, I, I found it to be a very welcoming and, and a very supportive place while, while I was, uh, while I was there. Your, your sense that astrophysics was where the excitement was, what was broadly going on in the field at that point? So my, my interest in astrophysics was mostly as a vehicle to learn techniques in experimental physics. Uh, the project that I got involved with, in, uh, which was building this uh, instrument for the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, uh, involved lasers, it involved microwave electronics, and analog and digital electronics and involved cryogenics and optics. And I viewed it as a way of learning a, a whole bunch of experimental physics techniques, less so than I viewed it as uh, where the excitement was. Um, of course, uh, I started to pick up uh, over time once I, once I joined the group and started working, I started to pick up over time what the excitement was. So I was part of, uh, you know, my uh, research, day-to-day -day research supervisor was Al Betts, who was a student of Charles Towns. Mm -hmm. uh, Towns, uh, after having spent time at MIT as the provost, I believe, uh, moved to Berkeley and established the uh, experimental astrophysics group. And I think his idea was to apply modern technology, including lasers, to various uh, areas in astrophysics, but particularly in the infrared, uh, and infrared and radio, but shorter wavelength radio. Uh, 
and and so that was that was interesting because uh, it was a time where uh, those fields were, you know, there were lots of discoveries being made, uh, and there were a lot of there was a lot of excitement that you know I started to understand, um, you know, the in in. 1969, uh, I, I believe it was 1969, uh, was the discovery of water uh, in the interstellar medium in 1970, or may also have been 1969, 1969 or 1970 was the discovery of carbon monoxide. Uh, and then after that came a whole slew of molecules in the inter interstellar medium and people for the first time were discovering um, material uh, in our galaxy that uh, really uh, had gone undetected uh, to that point. Molecular clouds, the birthplaces of stars. Um, and, you know, it was a brand new area with a lot of work to do a lot to understand and Townsend's group was in the thick of it um you know studying studying the problem from from various angles but Towns was interested also in uh you know you know anything and everything having to do with infrared astrophysics studying the center of the galaxy uh which he did with Reinhard Genzel who was my uh faculty uh, supervisor. He was the person responsible for tracking my progress towards PhD. And so Reinhardt and, and uh, Charles Towns in the 1980s did studies of the galactic center that were formative for Reinhardt mm -hmm. and led to his Nobel Prize. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I was following all of that. Uh, and, you know, as time went on, you know, the subject just just kept unfolding and getting more and more interesting for me. And so I, I fell into it for reasons that ended up being different than the reasons that I stayed in it. How big a gulf were those differences from beginning to completion, would you say? Well, you know, as a graduate, you know, you, you, the, the rate of learning uh in those years which is phenomenal uh, i mean the, the rate of learning while i was at caltech was uh you know incredible the Cal caltech is a place where uh you you simply can't keep up with the rate at which information is thrown at you it's, it's you know the, the saying is drinking from a fire hose well that was entirely true and at berkeley i'd say uh it was a little more manageable as a PhD student, but, you know, but yet there was so much to learn and uh, there so many opportunities to learn uh, that, uh, you know, those, those years at Berkeley, uh, you know, I, I, I felt that I, I picked up uh, just a huge amount. Jonas, how, how computational was your thesis? How important was data analysis? So as a as an undergraduate uh, at Caltech, uh, my well, let me let me back up earlier in in high school. Uh, I had an outstanding math teacher by the name of Bill Inhelder. He's the one that taught trigonometry when I was a sophomore, um, and he also had this course in computer programming in, at the high school. And we had these old uh, Olivetti, which is, I guess, an Italian firm, programmable desk calculators. They were, you know, giant things by today's standards. And they had magnetic cards and you could write a program of up to 120 instructions that you could do very rudimentary things like playing a moon landing game or something like that. Uh, and that's where I learned uh, how to program was taking that course. At least I learned how to program that machine. And that got me interested. And uh, the same math teacher, 
the summer after my junior year of high school, before I started Caltech, he offered another course in programming, which was now uh, uh, the Fortran language. Uh, and it was uh, held uh, not at the high school, but at the uh, Glendale uh, Board of Education headquarters, the headquarter building for the Glendale School District. And in the basement, they had a computer that they used for administrative functions, payroll and so on. It was a big machine room with this Burroughs something or other uh, computer, a you know, fairly modern computer uh, from that day. And uh, we would come in the evenings during the summer and we would spend three hours and we would bring our uh, card decks or punch card decks and we would, you know, put them into the card reader and we would watch the lights blink and the tape spin and whatever and, you know, our printouts would come out and we'd analyze, uh, you know, where we had misplaced the comma in our... <laughs> <laughs> stack cards and fix the air and go at it again. Uh, so that's where I learned kind of real computer programming. Uh, I, I picked up the Fortran language, at least at a you know basic level. Uh, so I was a little bit prepared by the time I got to Caltech in the summer uh, after freshman year, when I started working with the Cosmic Ray Group, it was to do data analysis. And I, I did several things as a, as a, that, that summer. I did some Fortran, uh, running Fortran programs uh, to, to, to do some data analysis. I didn't really understand too well what was going on. My job was just to do the mechanics of running the program. But then I also did some programming in the fourth language, which was the language uh, that was used for this uh, mini computer based real time data acquisition system. Uh, in fact, the same system that had been used to collect the calibration data for the, uh, this electron telescope uh, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. So I had started getting involved in computer programming. And then shortly thereafter, the group ended up getting a new computer. It was first a PDP 1135 and then later uh, 1170. These were mini computers, pretty good ones. And then a, a graduate student by the name of Rob Pike joined the group from, I believe, uh, University of Waterloo in Canada. And he brought with him uh, a tape that contained the Unix operating system. And so the Cosmic Ray Group at Caltech had the first Unix installation on the Caltech campus. Uh, the first ever Unix installation. This was the very early days of Unix. Uh, and so I started learning the C programming. I uh, remember my senior year and the summer after my senior year, uh, printing out the entire kernel of the Unix operating system and going through each routine in detail and figuring out what this operating system was doing. <laughs> And uh, it was, uh, it, you know, it was like reading poetry. These guys at Bell Labs, Kernigan and Ritchie and so on, the way they programmed was so elegant. And, you know, it, you, you could only admire it. You could never reproduce it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by the time I got to graduate school, I, you know, I, I'd gotten a fair bit of computing experience under my belt. I was not a, you know, professional but, you know, I was a reasonable amateur programmer. And I ended up doing an awful lot of programming uh, as a graduate student, because uh, in those days, um, if you wanted to analyze data, you basically had to do it yourself, starting from scratch. You had to write your own programs. And uh, so, you know, I, I can't tell you how much programming I did as a as a graduate student, I, I can tell you a few, a few of the things that I did. I was tasked with the problem of building a microwave amplifier, low noise cryogenic amplifier, uh, as the second stage of our receiver. Um, we had a 
high frequency diode mixer and the output of that was at microwave frequencies and I had to build the cryogenic low noise amplifier of the kind that radio astronomers might put on a radio telescope. And so I had to go dig into all the literature about how they were doing it uh, and then design one of my own and build it. Uh, so it's a pretty substantial project, except that um, the software to do microwave design, uh, there was a commercial program that was available on the uh, astronomy department VAX computer, the radio astronomy department at Berkeley had acquired this program and installed it there. Except the problem was the entire astronomy department was using this VAX computer and during the day uh, you, you couldn't get anything done. It was just so bogged down. And so that would mean, you know, staying up late, you know, working the night shift. And, and even then <laughs> the graduate students were busy crunching their astronomy data. And even then it wasn't so great. So I decided that this was not going to work for me. And what I needed to do was to write my own software so I could run it on the uh, IBM PC that our group had acquired and was sitting in the lab. And so I ended up writing uh, in Fortran a piece of software that was basically replicating much of the functionality of this commercial software package. Um, it would analyze microwave circuits and it, using the same syntax, using the same um, approach as this commercial software did. So uh, I, I don't know how long that program was, but maybe uh, 20,000 lines of code or something like that by the time I was done. Uh, so that was extremely useful for me because it forced me to really understand microwave theory mm -hmm. uh, and all the ins and outs. Um, so it was a teaching, it was a learning exercise as well. And, you know, there are many other things like that. I ended up writing the data acquisition system that we used for uh, uh, acquiring and recording data on our airborne flights, uh, which involved, you know, interfacing with hardware, writing assembly language code to, uh, you know, service the hardware. Uh, and then, you know, lots and lots of code to analyze data uh, to, to, you know, in various, but, you know, in comparison to what people do today, it was pretty crude because today uh, you, you get Python, you know, the entire world has written all kinds of routines that you can use to fit your data, to crunch it, to plot it, to manage it, whatever. And back in those days, you had to create everything from scratch. The, uh, one of the godsends that, that uh, really helped was the publication of this book called Numerical Recipes. Sure. Uh, which you may know, Bill Press. Oh, yeah. Uh, Saul Tukolsky, uh, maybe you've run into it. Uh, but having that book show up and having all the routines uh, in that book and having the written descriptions was, was like a gift from the heavens. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> What did it specifically allow you to do, or at least do more efficiently? Well, all, you know, before then, uh, you know, very often if you needed some basic, you know, just to fit your data, uh, you know, you'd have to either create the routine or maybe if, if you were lucky, you could find a paper that described the routine and the algorithm that you could implement. but. Uh, it was, it was, you were off in the wilderness, you were off on the, uh, off on your own. And here in this one book, you know, pretty much any kind of numerical routine you needed was in there, you know, whether it was to solve a linear system or to minimize a function, you know, just all kinds of extremely useful things were there. And you could not only get your hands on the uh, actual code, it came with these floppy disks that you could stick in your PC and just take the source code and in include it in your program. But you could also read the chapters and understand what it was doing. And if you needed, uh, you could go dig into the code and you could change it to make it do what you wanted it to do uh, if it wasn't quite what, what they had programmed. So 
it, it just was a huge time saver, but also a great educational tool. And uh, that 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 was, uh, I'd say, uh, you know, I, I you know I, I remember just being so happy <laughs> to, to to have that available. Jonas, more broadly for your thesis, what was happening in the world of interstellar medium research at that point, and how was your thesis responsive to to some of those questions? So, um, as I as I mentioned, the nineteen seventies were uh, uh, an era of discovery, where new molecule. It was an, an initial exploration of uh, of the molecular component of the interstellar medium, the dense gas from which stars are formed. And in the beginning, it was just, you know, there was a period where it was just discovery of molecules, you know, what's what's in this medium and, and the surprising richness of the chemistry. Uh, and then there was a mapping of the medium where, uh, you know, there were people like Pat Thaddeus, who was a professor uh, initially at Columbia and later at Harvard, uh, who had a small telescope uh, equipped with a sensitive receiver of the kind that Tom Phillips invented. And, and they were making maps of the entire galaxy and just, you know, producing images that showed you where these molecular clouds were in our galaxy. Uh, and so people were just trying to get their arms around what was this, you know, where were these clouds? What were they doing? What was in them? Uh, and eventually, you know, how did stars form from them? And so, uh, one of the discoveries that uh, Tom Phillips made in 1978 and 1979, and this was also flying on the Kuiper, um, uh, Tom had, in, in response to this challenge from Arno Penzias that I mentioned to you, where Arno challenged him to make a better receiver, well, Tom did, and he was flying that receiver on the Kuiper, and it was working at frequencies higher than anyone else was able to work at uh, at the time. And so Tom used that receiver to discover uh, not a molecule, but an atom, the carbon atom, neutral carbon atoms. Um, in this dense interstellar medium uh, at a, a wavelength uh, of 610 microns, a frequency of 492 gigahertz. Um, and what Tom discovered was that there was an awful lot of carbon. Uh, and so it became kind of a mystery. Where did the, you know, how come the abundance of carbon was so high? What was going on? Uh, so at the time, the thinking was that, well, you have the dense interstellar medium. Uh, it comes with a lot of molecules like CO and others uh, in the gas phase, but also uh, there's dust uh, in this dense interstellar medium. The dust makes uh, the, these clouds opaque to visible light uh, and ultraviolet light uh, produced by stars. But at the surfaces of these clouds, uh, you could imagine that uh, if uh, these clouds had given birth to some stars, you could have some young stars near one of these clouds. And especially if you had um, you know, more massive stars that produced a lot of ultraviolet, you can have this ultraviolet light shining on the surface of, this, of, of these clouds and the ultraviolet would penetrate uh, a little bit governed by the absorption and scattering by dust, but it would uh, break up the molecules. It would photo dissociate the molecules at the surface. The ultraviolet uh, photons would have enough energy to do that. And so it was thought that in that layer, uh, because the ultraviolet light was breaking up the molecules that you could have some carbon, uh, you could have a thin layer of carbon. Well, what Tom was finding was that there seemed to be more carbon uh, perhaps quite a bit more carbon than you could explain. Uh, and so there was a little bit of a mystery about how much carbon there was. And if there was as much carbon as some of Tom's measurements seemed to indicate, you know, what the heck was going on. Uh, and so that was the 
let's say the, the one of the topics of my thesis was to look at the um, there was another spectral line of carbon that you could get to at 809 gigahertz, a frequency that was higher than Tom's receiver could reach, but was within reach of the receiver that we built. And by comparing the 809 gigahertz measurements against Tom's measurements, we could get a better handle on how much carbon there was. So that was the, that was one big part of my thesis. And, and the answer from that was, there was still a lot, but perhaps not as much as kind of like the worst case. Yeah. So we bounded the problem a little bit. Uh, but then there was also ionized carbon, which was at a much higher frequency at 1900 gigahertz, 1 1.9 terahertz. And ionized carbon could also be produced in those regions. But by then it was known that uh, uh, there was a quite a bit of ionized carbon and the uh, ionized carbon was uh, it, 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 it was actually a very bright spectral line. Reinhardt uh, uh, Genzel and Charles Towns flying on the Kuiper in the mid 1980s started studying galaxies uh, using a different instrument and started to look at ionized carbon towards nearby galaxies and we're finding that um, it was, uh, you know, impressively bright. It was an impressively bright spectral line. Uh, in some cases, it looked like uh, this one spectral line could account for approaching 1% of the entire energy output of a galaxy. Just an impressive amount of energy to be collected and emitted in one spectral line. Um, and uh, so uh, we were, you know, un understanding what was going on with ionized carbon, where was this emission coming from, what more could we learn about it was, was an important problem. And uh, our instrument was able to spectrally resolve the line, was able to not just detect the fact that there was a spectral line, but was able to look at the details of the line shape. And by doing that, you could understand how the gas that was emitting uh, this ionized carbon spectral line was related to the molecular gas. Did it have the same spectral line profile or was it different? Uh, and it could give you clues about the emi uh, emission region. And so that was part of my thesis as well. And, and we found some interesting things uh, that were later rediscovered by the Herschel mission more than 20 years later. The fact that you often see ionized carbon uh, in absorption as well, not just in emission. And all of this relates to what's happening with ALMA today. Uh, ALMA is studying galaxies at extremely large redshifts at very, very, uh, you know, in the very early history of the universe using the ionized carbon spectral line because it's such a powerful line. It allows ALMA to see the great distances. And of course, uh, because of the redshift, uh, you can do it from the ground. Uh, 1.9 terahertz is, you, you can't see that from the ground. You have to be in a plane or in a balloon or in space. But when the redshift uh, is uh, six or seven, uh, you can easily see it from the ground. It, it shifts to long wavelengths that can get through the Earth's atmosphere. So it was, I'd say, uh, you know, that part of my thesis was very early work on a topic, ionized carbon, which, you know, you know has considerable relevance today still. On the building stuff side of things, was there anything relevant in either material science or engineering? Any advances at that point that made your research possible? Well, we were benefiting uh, a lot from, uh, you could say, advances in electronics writ large. Uh, the laser that we used was a gas laser. It was a carbon dioxide laser with a high voltage discharge. So the thing glowed uh, kind of like a neon tube. Of course, it had CO2 inside. 
uh, and then the CO2 laser would produce radiation at an infrared wavelength around 10 microns, and then that would go into another tube that was filled with some kind of strange gas like uh, ammonia or uh, difluoromethane or some other molecule that we, the CO2 laser would pump into some excited state, and then there would be a lasing transition in the far infrared uh, that we would then use to drive our receiver. Um, and that, I, I would say, was, uh, you know, far infrared lasers were, I forget how far back they go, but they were certainly known a decade before we were using them. And it wasn't like that technology was really going to go anywhere. It was big and bulky and clunky and difficult to manage. But it was mostly in electronics and, and semiconductor devices. So our, you know, our, the, the, our detector, the thing that received the light from the telescope was a diode, uh, a gallium arsenide Schottky diode that was produced by this group led by Bob Matow at the University of Virginia. And the descendants of that group are still around. There's a company called Virginia Diodes, which is uh, quite active today and produces uh, components for this part of the spectrum, the submillimeter far infrared, uh, their, their technology is very far advanced from uh, what it was back then. But it was this group uh, in the electrical engineering department at University of Virginia that was producing these things for us uh, and, and others. Um, but then after that, the amplifier, the microwave amplifier, the cryogenic amplifier that I mentioned, uh, there, we were really benefiting from what was going on in industry. Uh, gallium arsenide uh, transistors for microwave frequencies were really getting developed in those years. And uh, it made a big difference uh, to us as well as all of radio astronomy. Uh, in the late 1970s, Sandy Weinreb, who's still around at Caltech, you might want to talk to him at some point, um, a very famous uh, in radio astronomy, especially instrumentation. Uh, Sandy had started working with cryogenic transistor amplifiers and found that the noise performance could be competitive with uh, the other kinds of amplifiers being used back then, parametric amplifiers using uh, semiconductor diodes. And so a switch happened uh, in the early 80s to using these transistor, cool transistor amplifiers. And that's that was a big deal for us. Uh, five years before, we would not have been able to build the receiver that we built. Um, and then the micro, microwave electronics uh, after that also, I'd say, uh, you know, we were benefiting from what was happening in industry. Um, you know, any experiment uh, of that time, of that era, uh, was in the same situation that we were. We were riding the wave of stuff coming out of Silicon Valley, whether it was uh, analog electronics, you know, better lower noise analog components or digital electronics. You know, the fact that we were able to acquire our data using PCs was a big deal, big change. Um, and Jonas, on the other side, from the building, the engineering side, was your work connected to theory? Were there theories in astrophysics at that point that served as guide, as a guidepost or were theorists interested in what you were doing at the time? Yeah, so I, I, uh, there, there, there was a, a famous um, paper, uh, which was kind of our guidepost uh, by Xander Thielens and Dave Hollenbach, both of whom were at NASA Ames at the time, and it was a it's a, a comprehensive model of what would, what should be happening in these so-called photodissociation regions where 
you would have it. Uh, molecular cloud surface exposed to ultraviolet radiation. And so um, they had constructed a, a detailed model uh, of, you know, the physics and chemistry that should be happening uh, in those regions. And so they were worried about mechanisms for heating and cooling. Uh, how did the uh, ultraviolet light uh, how did the energy in the ultraviolet light, how was it absorbed? Where, where did that energy go? Uh, how was it uh, re-radiated uh, back into space? Uh, what uh, was the chemistry, the, the photochemistry, but not just the photochemistry, the uh, ion molecule chemistry in those regions? And what did that all mean? for the temperature distribution in these regions? What did it mean for the distribution of different chemical species, uh, et cetera? So they were, they were really looking uh, in detail, uh, uh, trying to assemble all of the knowledge that was then available about these things and trying to construct a detailed uh, theoretical model of, of what these regions should look like. So that was, I'd say, you know, one paper that was really uh, important. And we, uh, you know, it was, you know, by my description, I think you can tell there was a, 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 an awful lot of things to worry about. Yeah. And so it was a big fat paper with lots and lots of material in it. Uh, you know, so you learned a lot by studying that paper. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the di difficulty is that uh, it's really hard to confront the theory with experiment in a really rigorous way because there are so many unknowns still. Uh, and I think only later uh, did it start to become clear that um, things were a little more complicated, that you know, you shouldn't really think of these regions as just having a single surface, that the medium, the interstellar medium is because of turbulence, it's really got a complicated structure. You could think of it as being clumpy. You could think of it as being fractal. Uh, there isn't just a single surface. There could be regions that are dense and regions where the light is able to penetrate further. Um, and so the whole situation is considerably more complicated than represented in this uh, Thielens and Hollenbach paper. I'm oh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the Thielens and Hollenbach paper. But nonetheless, uh, I'd say there were, you know, there, there, there certainly was plenty of work happening, plenty of interest on the theory side uh, to, uh, uh, to make use of and to compare to. Finally, Jonas, last question for today. Besides Betts and McKee, who else was on your thesis committee? Paul Richards. So uh, I think I mentioned that Chris McKee uh, took over from Reinhardt. So Paul Richards uh, and, and Jack Welch. So Jack was a radio astronomer who uh, led the development of uh, the millimeter interferometer at Hat Creek uh, that later became the Berkeley, Illinois, Illinois, Maryland Array or BIMA, then later under Anila Sargent's leadership ended up joining with the uh, uh, millimeter array at Owens Valley. Uh, and together they formed something called CARMA, which was the California Association for Research in Millimeter Astronomy. Mm -hmm and which was uh, the combined radio telescopes, but now moved to a higher site uh, above the Owens Valley floor. Uh, and they operated for a while, and that was an Im important precursor to ALMA. Uh, they, were, they were, you know, both in terms of science and technology, uh, they were preparing the way for ALMA. Um, so that was Jack Welch. Uh, Jack was, uh, um, the 
uh, at least one of the advisors of uh, John Carlstrom, who was my uh, classmate at Berkeley, who then came to Caltech as an assistant professor, and we worked closely together until he left for Chicago. He's now the Chandrasekhar professor right. at Chicago, quite famous in cosmic microwave background. Um, so I knew Jack uh, also through John, because I, you know, John would tell me about what he was working on. Um, and then Paul Richards was uh, Andrew Lang's thesis advisor, mm -hmm. uh, and also John Mather's thesis advisor. John, of course, won the Nobel Prize uh, in physics for uh, the work he did using COBE, the Cosmic uh, Background Explorer uh, NASA satellite. Uh, and Paul was, a, let's say, a real dominant figure in millimeter and far infrared cosmology and astrophysics uh, through his career. He, he, and, he and Tom Phillips, let's say, really sort of had parallel careers. Mm -hmm. In fact, both of them were involved. Uh, both of them were, are co-inventors of the superconducting tunnel junction mixers that Alma uses. Uh -huh. But it was Tom that actually went on to use them for astronomy, whereas uh, Paul Richards group did some lab experiments and focused on showing that you could get low noise performance of, of approaching the limits set by quantum mechanics. But his heart was more in the microwave background work and really focused more on uh, microwave background uh, balloon projects as opposed to using the, the superconducting receivers for astronomy. And that's what uh, Andrew Lang was involved in. Andrew was involved in a rocket experiment uh, looking at the, uh, not the cosmic microwave background per se, but trying to see uh, at shorter wavelengths uh, was, you know, what was going on. And uh, in his rocket experiment, which was a collaboration with Japan, uh, they thought they had measured uh, excess radiation at shorter wavelengths, um, which turned out uh, later not to be uh, uh, correct. It turned out that something, I forgot what the explanation was, but the, the, the background they, they thought they found wasn't, wasn't there at the end of the day. But the true background was discovered by Kobe in the mid nineties. I think I mentioned that last time. Yeah. Well, so Jim Paul was, Paul was on my thesis committee and in 2003, uh, Paul and I wrote a review paper together on uh, superconducting detectors for millimeter and submillimeter uh, astronomy. Wow. <laughs> well, Jonas, on that note, we'll pick up next time, postgraduate life moving forward.